So this is Jacques Newell Taylor. Yes. He is one of my favorite teachers I've ever had <laughs> in my life. And I met him originally in California teaching a functional neuroscience course that really mm. changed, I would say, the trajectory of a lot of things in my life with a mm. few simple concepts that he taught me. So he's a health specialist, if you would call it that. But it goes a lot beyond that we're going to get into in the interview today. And I would like to preface with the one thing I told you about mm. when we first met up in, in Maine the other day. The, the idea of many ideas that really broke my mind and then mm. slowly put it back together was this idea of how these moms can lift cars off of their children, hmm. although it's not like they go to the gym and train to lift cars. The question <laughs> is, how is that possible? Yeah. And just by understanding that that's a possibility and then trying to break it down scientifically, we have to ask, mm. what the heck is happening? And what mm. do we actually know about strength? Mm. And what is this whole body Thing. So we're going to get into some of those questions today, but I also have a bunch of questions about his past and his history. By the way, he's about to turn 50. So get a quick look at this guy. He's about to turn 50 right now. I am 30. What am I doing wrong? Anyways, we're going to get into all those questions and more, but I want to dig into his past a little bit and find out how he became the legend that he is today in the community that he's in. So thank you for coming on and I'm excited to dig in. It's my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. And for the first time ever, I brought my phone because I have so many questions. <laughs> so we're going to carve through these as fast as we can because we have less than an hour. Yeah. So we are in Bar Harbor, Maine right now. Mm -hmm. We are on a street. Garage doors open behind what you guys can see. This is his studio, which is beautiful and classic Maine decor of all this wood. So you might hear some noises from the streets. And who knows, we might get a little community gathering outside if they like what we're talking about. <laughs> so... I'm really, really curious. What's the single most beneficial belief that mm. you have that you think humanity could benefit from? Mm. The single greatest thing. <laughs> Let's start with something easy. Huh? Um, I think um, it's curiosity. Curiosity will allow you to um, empathize. It'll allow you to be uh, uh, creative. It'll allow you to be innovative um, and flexible. Um, so that, that's what I think it is. It's about being curious. Whenever, wh whether you have a body sensation and you usually associate it with pain, be curious about it. If you have a sensation that's uh, uh, associated with, um, I don't know, happiness, be curious about it. If, uh, if your friend has some sort of issue that they're, you know, they're expressing some sort of angst, be curious about it. Uh, somebody says something that you don't agree with, be curious about it. So I think that's what it is. So yeah. to be curious about that, yes. where do you, uh, I'm going to draw way, way back. Let's yeah, go yeah. like childhood. Yes. Were you a curious young man? Yes. Why? Yes. It makes me almost want to cry to think about this. I'm really, I, I, uh, I remember when we were learning about numbers and we were learning how to go from one, two, three, four, and we were learning about addition. And I would see a kid that would constantly get stuck. Because I always wanted to know what happened in between. I wanted to know what happened between one and two. And there was just no time for that. It was Jacques, there's one, then there's two, there's three. Stop asking about what's in between. But I found myself doing that all the time. I was very, very curious. I, I, I couldn't take some of the leaps that were necessary. Well, eventually I did. I had to. I learned that. Jacques, now's not the time for that. I just want to know, well, when is the time? When can you truly just say, Why? Could it be some other way? Is there another way to look at that? Oh, okay. Oh, so we don't know. All right, that's okay. Yeah. So it's been, it's been, it's, it's been it. That's since as long as I can remember. Wow. Okay. So, so <laughs> yeah. you're in the health space. Yeah. But you were asking what's between one and two. How yeah. many things have you <laughs> dug into at this point? Like, what was your first fascination, if you can remember from childhood? Like, what was the thing that got you really excited to begin with outside of questioning the math teachers? Uh, the first thing I got excited about was, um, and it comes with a little story. There is a man that uh, went to our church who had a prosthetic arm. He had a little hook, hook uh, on the end of his arm. And I was wondering if there's something we could do for him. So... Um, I went home, I started looking at the encyclopedias because back in the day we all had encyclopedias and I pulled it out. I was looking at the nervous system. And I wanted to figure out how could I make a hand for him. And I thought the coolest thing I wanted to understand is, is there a way that he could control this hand? And what I learned is that our nervous systems actually somehow use 
electrical impulses as the basis of communication. That was the first thing that I kind of looked into to say, well, how does this stuff work? And I've always been curious about that. And I thought, wait a minute, what is, what is electricity? And then understanding that it's just the mo movement of current. Well, what's the movement of current? It's just these charged particles moving along. Well, what are the charged particles? And then learning about all these different things that carry charges and therefore could be current uh, uh, makers and then figuring out, okay, so then we could make these transducers that could help this guy. And this, that's the earliest thing I could remember was designing a model for a prosthetic device for this guy. How old were you? Uh, I want to say I was somewhere between, uh, I think that was like 10-ish, 10, 11-ish, somewhere in there. At 10 yeah. or 11, you designed yeah. a potential prototype for a prosthetic arm, well, uh, theoretical. Yeah. Theoretical. Yeah. The, you didn't know the, the, the literal physics of it. Yeah, the idea was there. The, I knew the word transducer and tra transduction, the idea of converting one type of energy into another. And I knew enough that there had to be some sort of mechanical control of these things independently. Um, and I knew that he was going to have to learn how to have the skill to use it. So. And then you yeah. got into X Men. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. at the time, that was the yeah. only real life thing for that. Right. Where now, I think it's been it's been done it's, many it's times been done. in many different it's ways. It's been done. Yeah, it's been done. So that was the beginning of like deep scientific curiosity for yes. you of yes. that guy. And yes. when you say curiosity is the number one thing you would like to bestow on the world, right? Yes. From your life of, of wisdom, yes. what are some other examples of that in your life uh things where you've applied curiosity where it's really changed you that, that you think mm. people would benefit from from mm. hearing and where could people apply it mm. um i think of uh, a really simple thing when you ask questions like this will be for some reason a strong flash will come and i can remember i was training to be a uh, a guide one of my greatest teachers um had me out on a run this guy uh, tony molina and we're out on this run and he's training me to be a, a, a mountain guide just for day guides out in the Sierra mountains. And we're running along and I'm saying, Tony, I, I think I'd like to take a break. And he said, why do you feel like you need to take a break? You know, he said, no, don't slow down. And I'm like, okay. And we're running along and he said, why do you, th I'm breathing hard and I'm starting to feel that feeling in my chest. He's like, okay, but what do you think that feedback means? Well, I don't know. I'm working hard. Okay. Well, what do you think you need in order to keep going? he was modeling curiosity for me because I automatically had this reflexive response when my body's working hard, stop. As opposed to, well, maybe that's what it's designed to do. Maybe I can do a little bit more. Let's see, what could I give my body right now? A little bit of water, a little bit of food. So that's one of the, the ways that um, when, we're, when we're faced against something that is uh, challenging, sometimes being curious about, well, what could I do to make this challenge a little bit lighter? Uh, I think that was my first experience with it. Um, I think it's also been in terms of uh, just being in business for yourself, is just being curious about, well, how can I change my message so that more people understand what I'm trying to say and what I have to offer? That kind of curiososity. So there are, I just bumped your microphone. That's okay. Right. There are a lot of different ways of, of applying it. Those are the things that immediately popped in my head. Oh, I think about it even in terms of our, uh, the condition of our, of our planet. Um, and we have people who have different opinions about um, whether it's the ecosystem or about uh, the border of a country. We need, all need to have a little bit of curiosity. How did it get like that? How can I live next to my neighbor and actually have a peaceful coexistence? How can we thrive on this planet uh, and make sure that it remains healthy for everyone, including our animals and our oceans? Right. So, yeah, curiosity, I think, is it's the thing that allows us to um, sometimes abandon the plans that we have come to believe in only to shape new plans that are informed by more information. Beautiful. I, yeah. I really like the analogy of of that mountain and you feeling mm. that stress build up and mm. when that stress builds up whether it's emotional whether it's uh -huh. physical no matter what it is yep. your first response and rightfully so should be whoa stop yeah right and what you're saying is let's let's be really clear that when we feel that response to just stop things take a second response and say why yeah 
Like, why do I need to stop? Yeah. Is this what I want to be doing? Yeah. Am I saying stop because That's is right. this the wrong thing to be doing? That's right. Or because I just need some help? That's right. And does anyone else need to help or do I need to help? That's right. right. That's and it. And just explore that more. So I That's love it. that as an idea. That's it. It's just, and, and what's, I think what's liberating about that is that it, 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 I also feels like it frees you from feeling like you need to know all the answers. Mm. <laughs> and, and this is a, this is a critical thing that has taken me, it, it took me a very long time to understand. I doubt mm. I'll ever fully understand this mm. concept, but what you're bringing up right now is we don't need all the answers, but we do need a process of questioning. Yes. Yes. And questioning is the answer in itself. Yes. It's just yes. knowing how to continuously ask healthy questions. Yes. And what's interesting about that is we know that when you have that skill to do that, that means that you're enriching your ability to learn, which means that you're keeping your brain engaged. And if you're doing that, your brain will stay healthy into old age. The worst thing that can happen to us as a species is we feel like we master something. You get a job and then all you do is retread those same beliefs and skills without that curiosity. And then guess what? All the centers in your brain that are used for learning, that are used for memory, that are used for acquisition, that are used for curiosity, they atrophy and our brains actually get smaller. Mm. But if we can do something where we actually build in this curiosity where we get to go, I'm going to learn, I'm going to keep learning. I'm going to keep questioning. We get to maintain the health, the structure of our brains as we get older. And let's talk about how health plays a role in that. Cause I know that's mm. your sweet spot mm -hmm. because I want to branch out of health during this conversation, but yep. let's go straight into, yep. you said earlier, the idea of curiosity and asking as a business owner, yes. how do people understand what you do, what your expertise is and what you have to offer? Yes. What would you say that is, what is your expertise? What do you have to offer? Because I, I know extreme depth mm. and not even close to what you mm. totally know of what you have to offer, but I'm curious mm. for them to know a brief synopsis so we can dive deeper and they can join us on that journey. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I still struggle with answering that question. I still do. Um, um, because I, can I offer? Absolutely. Uh, you said this the other day. Yes. And I think this is a beautiful thing. Yes. That helps describe what it exactly is that you do in this yes. gym and, and why you taught functional neuroscience and what you teach now. Yes. The sea creatures, right? <laughs> what, what type of sea creature was it? Uh, uh, I think it's called an... No, it's not an animal. It's a sea squirt. That's a what it's called. A sea squirt. Sea squirt. So yeah. they, they roam around the water mm -hmm. until they find a good place, a good coral reef or a rock mm -hmm. to hang out on. Mm -hmm. They attach to it. Mm -hmm. And once they attach to it, they no longer need to move for the rest of their life to right. survive and, right. and I guess thrive for their existence, That's right? That's right. And when they do that, because there's no more movement in their life, they mm -hmm. eat their brain. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well said. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, I'm a movement chauvinist. I like to say that. And I, I, th I believe a man named Dave Chalmers actually came up with that, uh, with that phrase. But the idea is that when you are training your body, you are inevitably and inextricably training your mind. So the idea is if there are certain uh, behavioral attributes that you are aspiring to have or certain behaviors that you are trying to modify, you can work on those things as you move your body. If you are not intentionally placing your mind as you're exercising, you might be training things that you don't want to really want to train. If for example, you are training and you're thinking, um, I always want to crush the weights. I'm waging war on the weights. I have to get angry to, to lift these weights. You're training those parts of your brain, those aggressive parts of your mind. You're training this part of your brain that says in order to do something healthy or good for yourself, you must struggle. And I don't know if that's really what we want to train. And that's not to say that you won't struggle as you exercise, but to frame that in a way of saying, you know what, I'm actually seeing what my body is capable of, as opposed to, I have to be uh, slogging this thing. So what I offer to people is a way of designing an exercise program that feels good for them. That's something they can be excited about. It's something that actually moves them towards their goals. And it might not be a quick fix, but it'll be something where they'll be able to steadily monitor their progress as they move along. Whether it's from rehab or peak performance or anywhere in between weight loss, we can do it. And it can all be done in a way that actually feels good. And you get to honor yourself, pay attention to how you feel, and modify your exercise accordingly. 
And to take this even further, right? Yeah. So we're describing it in these really simple terms right now, yes. where it's like, yes. of course, uh, yes. when you take care of your body and you do it in a way that's loving and in a way that, like I always talk about self-love being a core tenant of this fulfilling air thing. Yes. When you do yes. it in a way that's self-loving and do it in a way that allows you to become more of who you are and your mind is more active, your mm -hmm. personality is more vibrant, right? Mm -hmm. There's more dynamic mm -hmm. to just your expression mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. it's done through health and of course all those little things will happen of course you will lose weight as you get happier and healthier mm -hmm. of course you will get stronger as you get happier and healthier so it's really inevitable that when you do this neurologic training all of this mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. that all of those little things will happen so if you're coming for weight loss sure yes of course that'll happen yes and that could be the main driver that brings you in but that's just call it a mirage on top of the whole picture and the thing underneath is the core. And, and this is something I've noticed with clients in the past when I was a trainer is they would mm -hmm. get their goal. They mm -hmm. would lose the weight they wanted to weight and then they'd be floundering and they'd be, they That's would, right. they're not sure where to go from here. That's right. How do you maintain that? And the question is maybe forgetting the word maintain and saying like evolving through mm -hmm. this whole process, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Of yes. like what, yes. what is like in your eyes, let me make sure we're, yeah. In your eyes, like what is exercise? Hmm. Exercise in my eyes. Hmm. I'm going to say that it's physical exertion that requires more energy than you need just walking up a flight of stairs or walking around your house. And why right? do we need to do it? We need to do it so that our bodies produce these very specific hormones, okay? So when muscles contract at a specific intensity, they produce hormones that cross the blood-brain barrier and actually keep our brains healthy. And the blood-brain <laughs> barrier is this thing that sits up here that makes it so it's hard to get things up there? Yes. It unless is, it's paired with something specific or... It either has to be paired with something specific or it has to be a molecule of, that has a receptor in that barrier that says you, you can come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can come in. You, no, you stay outside. It's like a bouncer. Right? It is a the, bouncer. It's a big bouncer. It's a big bouncer. And Everybody so can't come to the brain. if I don't exercise, it's very hard to get things through the bouncer. Well, if you don't exercise, you don't get these hormones produced. So yeah, they don't get to, they don't even get to the bouncer, right? So these hormones, one is called brain-derived neurotropic factor. Now that sounds like a typo, right? A um, brain-derived neurotropic factor is made in the brain, but it is also made in your contracting muscle tissue. So when you exercise, you actually produce this molecule that then gets into your brain and allows your brain to do all kinds of cool things. So are you saying that if I don't exercise, yes. my brain, like that sea squirt, yes. could slowly deteriorate? Your brain, like that sea squirt, is not going to be getting all of the th things that it could get. And there will be parts of your brain, yes, that will atrophy. Now, if you are um, someone who is disciplined enough, you can maintain certain areas of your brain through a mental practice without moving your body at all, right? This is like meditation gurus and... I would say meditation gurus, and then there are some people who don't have a choice. They can't move, mm. right? So there's no doubt that they are able to maintain the sharpness of their brains even though they can't move. Like a Stephen Hawking. Like a, Perfect example. Perfect example. Uh, for the rest of us, though, we have the ability to move. We should use it, right? It will make our, our, our acuity, our mental acuity, a lot easier to maintain. So is there yeah. a way of exercising that I could get more of what you're talking about? And is yes. there a way where I could get less? Yes, there is. Yes, okay, there so is. There's, a, there's maybe, not to say a bad way, but a worse way. Yes, there is. And there's a better way. Yes, there is. Absolutely. So... Um, if you think about, uh, your, your, your attitudes about exercise, if you don't like it, if you don't like exercising, don't do it. Stop it right now. Okay. The reason being is if you view exercise as a stressful endeavor, something you do not like for whatever of those positive hormones that you generate, they will not even get to the bouncer because of your cortisol response, because of your stress response mm. to the exercise. Okay. So stress sort of fights the good stuff. It fights the good stuff. Mm. Okay, it fights so, the good stuff. So then um, you can come back to that, but let me yes. ask a quick question. So does that mean if I have stress in other areas of my life, 
but I do this exercise thing you're talking about, it will battle that stress. If I can't reduce this other stress. It absolutely will. And here's mm. how it works. It's a really cool thing that if you can exercise and you actually enjoy it, it actually makes you a little bit more resistant to the effects of that stress in the other parts of your life. And that's a really, really cool thing. That's and beautiful. that's why exercise must remain your non-stressful activity. It can't turn into something where you're competing with yourself or somebody else. If competition makes you feel stressed, if that gives you some juice, go for it. But anything, any attribute that you find stressful, don't let exercise become that thing, right? Um, and if you find exercise stressful, you should speak with someone who can help you design something that you actually enjoy because it can be quite wonderful. Mm. You really can. So if I'm stressed in this area yep. and I can do this exercise that helps yep. me become more resilient to stress in my yes. life, yes. what can I do? Now I'm, I want to do that all the time. How can I maximize the good side of this exercise thing? So let's say okay. maybe on one example, I like the gym and on one example, I hate the gym, okay. but I like kayaking. Like how can I maximize the gym and how can I maximize like a sport activity like kayaking or okay. hiking? The most important thing if you enjoy exercising is to know how much you need to recover. Oh, okay. Right? So you can have your exercise um, and, and, and also to understand the cost of really pushing yourself hard. Now, that's not, a, that's not necessarily problematic, but if you decide to push yourself really hard, what does that cost? How am I going to actually recover from that expenditure? Okay, that becomes really important because if your body's not ready for the next bout of exercise, now exercise has become a physiological stress and it's not going to be as helpful for your other stresses in your life. Got it. So that you're saying sense? that... Here's my stress. Here's my exercise that makes me resilient to stress. Yes. But if I go over a certain part, it yes. will now add to that stress That's and it. not make me as resilient. That's it. That's so it. So how do I know? How, how do I, yes. what are some metrics? Are there things I can feel? How do I know yes. that? There are a couple of things. So if you have, let's say you've been exercising regularly and you want to know, and I, and you feel like, yeah, you push yourself a bit, you know, and it feels good to you. And you want to know, is that creating, um, a, a deleterious, a negative response in your body. What you can do is you can wear one of those Fitbits or an Apple Watch or Garmin, a lot of people make them, or you can even use your iPhone, I believe, and you can check your heart rate variability first thing in the morning. And what that will tell you is how recovered you are. It'll give you a spit out a number essentially that says, look, you've recovered well, get after it, or whoa, don't do too much today. If you worked out that hard, then Definitely don't do that much today, but that might also undermine its ability to help you with mm -hmm. the other stresses in your life. So that might mean that you might need to back off just a little bit on the intensity of your exercise. Your goal might be able to run that distance in that time, but you might need to run a little bit slower or do a little less distance if you want to get the stress reducing benefits of that exercise. Right. Does that make sense? And now I have another quick question because yes. this is like a, a laser sword. I feel like a, this yes. is a lightsaber to a yes. good answer, which is what are like one, two or tops three movements mm. that are like, like I, I like to think of it like this, like the dirty dozen with mm. fruits and vegetables and the clean 15. What's like <laughs> the clean one, two or three of exercise where I'm like, cause like is running something that I should be doing if I mm. want to become resilient to stress or, or what are, like one, two, or three, if I'm, if I'm able-bodied, I'm relatively healthy, I don't have any mechanical issues. Yeah. Like what would be the exercises? Um, that's really hard because, and I'll tell you why it's so hard. I would say number one, you've got to like it. Mm, okay. Number so I've one, you've like got to like it. Whatever it is I'm doing. Whatever you're gonna do. Um, and what does that mean? Because like obviously I don't, I don't like feeling like I'm getting beat up during a workout. I don't like feeling the burn per se, or I don't like making the time when I have so many other responsibilities with kids and whatever, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but, but let's say I enjoy the aftermath of it. Like I love the feeling of feeling strong and I love the yes. sweat, right? Yes. And I like that it's doing yes. good for me. So I enjoy the process, but of course, like, there's a gradient to that. So while I like that burn and the sweat, there's going to be people who are like, I like the aftermath. I like that it's healthy for me, but like the process of getting sore, not as fun. Right. So for, for that individual, um, let's say that their goal is, um, um, 
give me a goal. Uh, Let's say that they, um, they want a six pack. They want a six pack. So that means that they're going to have to lose a bit, little bit of body fat and they eat. And one of the things that'll make that easier is if they have a bigger engine, a little bit more lean body mass. So what I would say to that person is here's what we're going to do. We're going to do one set of this exercise. We're going to say a leg press. Okay. Leg press, that's typically something people feel pretty comfortable on. We're going to do this exercise, and at some point, I want you to tell me when you feel like you've only got four left in the tank. That's all you can do. At this point, you could do four more. When you get to that point, you're going to stop. You don't have to go to failure. You're going to stop at that point. And you I'm don't gonna, have to go to failure. So this is a key. This let's is pull a that out. key thing. If you're looking for an increase in lean body mass, you do not have to go to failure. If you're looking for an increase in lean body mass, you do not have to go from this exercise to that exercise to this one. You can give yourself a full two minutes in between. And we've got data stretching back probably 20 years now that shows that people who take breaks that are a little bit longer actually do a little bit better with their lean body mass acquisition, okay? So for that individual, I would say, look, we got some opportunity for you to really back off a little bit. Perhaps. Okay. So let me, let me right. wrap this up and yeah. bow tie that and see yeah. if I have this right. I should exercise because it helps me become resilient to stress in life and stress in exercise. Yes. Right. But if I do it well and I, I have an ample amount of recovery enough mm -hmm. and I can do that by testing my HRV. And yep. There's many different ways to do that. Yep. Some are maybe more accurate than others, but we'll get into that later. Right. That's right. That's right. And if I go to exercise, mm -hmm. if I can add in, you know, let's say over a minute of recovery between something. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing that exercise or doing that leg press, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about is A, I like this and I enjoy this. And that's very important that I find exercises that I enjoy and that yeah. I understand that as I'm fatiguing that muscle, as I'm starting to feel that light to moderate burn, yeah. hormones are getting released. That's and true. those hormones are gonna come up and they're gonna feed my brain and yeah. I'm gonna be happier, healthier. My brain's not gonna be the C. Uh, the C spurt, squirt, yep. squirt, the yep. C yep. squirt, yep. right? Yep. Yep. And I'm right. going to potentially have a more robust brain. Yes, yes, yes. Well, very well uh, summarized. Uh, there's something that I wanted to to add. Yes, the other thing with with that um, with that leg press, if as you're doing it though, this is the important part. If you get on there and you go, this doesn't feel right. It, my back doesn't feel quite right. Okay, let's see if we can make an adjustment. Right? Don't ignore curiosity. Yeah, curiosity. Right. So don't ignore feedback. Insist that your exercise professional design something for you that feels great. Got it. So right? if, if any part of the movement feels weird, let's see what we can do to change it. And if we, we can't, let's yeah. try a different movement. Yeah. And, and the other thing too is um, uh, sometimes we have to be curious about the sensation that we get. So if you, for example, you're doing a leg press and you start to feel some work being done in your back instead of just shutting it down like, oh my God, you can kind of go, huh, I wonder what that's about. Hey, Bob, what do you think that's about? And Bob can tell you, oh yeah. Maybe Bob's this, a trainer. Bob's a trainer, yeah. And Bob might be able to give you some feedback or some things that, that might make you a little bit more comfortable about that work that you're feeling being done by your lower back or something to do to eliminate that work that's being done. Got it. Right. So I don't know why Bob is standing next to us yeah. and why he's this tall, but you know, he's there apparently. He's there. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really curious now if we, if we lightsaber again yep. through this, right? Mm -hmm. We've got our one, two, or three ideal movements, but there, I know there's this whole thing about like uh, muscle confusion that that mm. has gone around for so many years now, mm. decades, I think, right? And to lay out for people that don't know what muscle confusion, the theory behind it is, is you cannot do the exact same movements forever and get benefits from it. You need to be changing those movements. There needs to be variation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Is that true? Is there truth to it? Well, what's really interesting is that um, hmm. you, you can go through the same path of motion, right? Like this. And I could load that in such a way that it's not the same experience for your body, right? Okay, so like more weight, less weight. Or a change in the way that the weight is applied to you. So sometimes it's really hard right here and then really easy right there, or make it really hard right here and really easy up here. Mm -hmm. And right? how can I do that when I'm on my own? Uh, you can use bands, you know, mm -hmm. like... Uh, so yeah, so like resistance bands get right? harder at one point, easier at one point. Depending on where they're anchored, right? 
Oh, so I change where I anchor the oh, band. Good. You can so change like where you low, anchor. medium, or high. high, right? So that's going to be a big, or sometimes from behind you or down on the ground. Okay, so I can right. do the same movements. I just need to find subtle ways to change them. Got it. So if I'm doing like, like squats because I don't have a leg press, I can yes. like hold the bottom of a squat. Yes. And not just go up and down and up and down. Yes. You could start. Uh, How often do I need to change the variation? That's going to depend on your goal. Okay. And it's going to also depend on. Um, so if I want like a really healthy brain and I just want to be cognitively amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would say here's how you could do it. You would set up some sort of a, of a goal for, of a, a, an achievement goal for that motion, right? For that exercise. Once you hit it, it's time to change things, right? So you could say, all right, I've, I've set, I want to do 45, be able to do 45 body weight squats without stopping. Once you get there, it's like, okay, I got to change things a little bit. What do I want to do? Do I change the range of motion a bit? Make sure I'm hovering down closer to the bottom. Do I add a little bit of a jump, right? Mm, okay. Things like that. Okay. Do I now make it a split stance squat, which mm -hmm. is a bit of a lunge or, oh, I, this would be a really cool thing. There's this thing that I've been calling a rocker lunge, where instead of doing your traditional straight down and up lunge, your back leg, you basically straighten it out as you come up. So you basically kind of shoot yourself forward. Mm -hmm. So you have a, it's very similar to the to a lunge, but. It's literally like a here and there, or uh, is it literally here? It, it's there, and then what, just straighten out, keep your back foot, uh, do that again. Mm -hmm. And now all I want you to do is straighten out your back knee. That's going to shoot you forward, right? See how oh. that pushes you forward that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so it's really hard. Yeah, and it's going to load <laughs> up really that front hard. leg. Yeah. As opposed to loading up the back leg where a lot of people feel that lunge. So this is a right? great at-home thing yeah. and just a, a little change, yeah. which is actually challenging. Absolutely. So so I, I, I know that I didn't quite answer the give me, you know, three great exercises that you can do simply because the exercises that I typically design for people are for that individual. And... I think that um, as an individual, you can figure that out for yourself. You can. You can look at a library of exercises and say, I will try this one today. How does that feel? I like that. That's great. Let's try this flavor. I didn't like that. That just felt weird here. Mm -hmm. And I don't have anybody here to give me any feedback, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do that exercise. Yeah. And with your core tenant of I must like it. That is critical. Then it, it's okay to do that one and say, no, 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 I don't, I don't even want to do a second rep of yes. that. So here's what I would say to anybody who is um, who wants their dirty, their their clean five 15, yeah, or fifteen, yeah. whatever, is to literally take any app that you want, take any poster that's got exercises that you want, try it, and if it doesn't feel good, you stop. The other thing that the other caveat that I'll say is any exercise that you do, do not violate your own active range of motion. So if the exercise is this, I'm not going to let any machine push my hands past this point. Or any so, so you're or saying anything. like I can pull my hands this far, but yeah. if there's something pushing against me and it pushes me further, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Okay. Don't Why? Happen. Why is that? It's um, uh, you you increase the likelihood of triggering this thing called neurogenic inflammation. Okay. Which is the showstopper. It is the showstopper. It is one of the things that will also knock down all those great hormones you're trying to produce. It is the thing that will make your joints feel achy and not so good. Um, it is a thing that might even affect the way your digestive system feels as a result of working out. Wow. It is the stuff that makes your head feel a little bit cloudy as a result of working out, right? Oh, so, so let me give you an example real quick. Let's say I'm training for a marathon, Yes. right? And I have one of my long run days and it's like mm -hmm. 14 miles, 14 right? It's miles. one of the longest runs I'll do in yes. training for it. Yes. And I get done and I hit, I hit the mile marker. My watch goes off. Yep. I lay down on the grass yep. and I pass out for 30 minutes and I wake up and I'm like groggy and I need to get food. And, and this is seen as normal in, <laughs> in marathon training, right? Yes. Yes. That's neurogenic inflammation. Um, no, that probably is, well, actually it could be, there could be some neurogenic inflammation if, um, depending on how well your feet are doing, how well you're. Um, so let's say I've got cramps. Cramping you up. know, like at 14 miles, I'm not feeling so great mechanically. Um, my knee yeah. hurts a little bit. Yeah. You definitely got some neurogenic inflammation going on. But the thing that made, made you pass out is probably a combination of um, uh, blood glucose levels being, you know, super low um, and uh, blood pressure might be a little, little wonky. Um, the neurogenic inflammation, though, shouldn't be a lights out kind of thing. That is just that's just going to if you were to try to run some more later that day or even the next day, 
you would notice that your performance is greatly diminished. Like right? it feels so hard to run, That's even right. though I had run so well. That's right. Because, oh, this is a really cool thing. Um, and I'm going to geek out just for half a second here. Oh. There are these things called sen uh, uh, type 3 and type 4 sensory endings that are buried in your muscles. And okay. they are giving your brain feedback about how hard those muscles are working. It is telling your brain about the mm -hmm. concentration of all these metabolites, all these little waste products of cellular mm -hmm. metabolism. So they're the scouts and they're like, hey, this is... This is there's a fire down There's here. There's something going on down <laughs> yeah. here. And eventually your brain goes, okay, we've had enough. And therefore, the motor cortex will stop sending down the signals to keep going. It, it's, it, it so it's not that the muscle can't do it. It's that these scouts are working well. And the brain is like, hey, if, you, if it keeps working, we're going to have too much waste that we can't deal with. So we just shut it down. Shut it down. Start, start pulling it back. You are not mm -hmm. clearing out the waste product. So we're going to start to pull back. We're not going to let you work as hard. We'll let you keep moving because we're assuming that you're doing this because there's a bear behind us. Mm -hmm. So we'll let you keep moving. But in order so that we can keep moving at any pace, we're going to diminish how far, how fast and how far you go. Got it. Does that make so sense? if I notice that I'm exercising and I've yeah. got, say, like for me, I like to do a little bit of movement every mm -hmm. day, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Right. And my core tenant has always been, if I can't do tomorrow what I did today, mm -hmm. I likely did a little too much. Meaning like mm -hmm. if my recovery is so great that it's like I cannot keep going tomorrow, yes. I yes. probably did a little too much yesterday and let me tone it down and recover a bit so I can do essentially a similar level of intensity every day until I have like a big hike or if I want to like work out with a friend, it's sure. more intense, right? That's a, that's a fair measure. That's a totally fair measure. Um, it's, whereas if somebody had a different goal and they said, look, you know, I am a, I am a candidate for a firefighter academy, right? And uh, there are certain things that I really don't do well right now. I can't even lift some of the re required loads. The intensity of their workouts might be such that the next day their capacity is greatly diminished. But we're, we're going to anticipate that and we're going to make sure that they are in a recovery protocol. Right? Okay, so... Describe to me and let's see how long you have. Oh, we got plenty yes. of time. Yeah, yeah. What does a recovery protocol look like? Great food, good rest, and um, and I'll say a little bit of activity. And okay, so let's go with the easiest answer first. What's a little bit of activity look like in a recovery protocol? Okay, uh, I'd say that it's about a tenth of what they did for their workout. So it could and be similar movements, but very low intensity, very low intensity. And it would probably, the, the similar in the movement, um, would probably be instead of bilateral be unilateral one side moving while the other side is staying still. So if I um, was doing uh, bicep curls the day before that was mm -hmm. really intense or I was lifting something heavy with yep. that motion, yep. you're saying that the next day I want to do less total movement at one time. I would do, I would do a lot less volume in terms of the load. Like I said, it would be like a 10th of what you did if yep. we do that. Mm -hmm. And I might even make it more of a compound thing where I'm allowing the biceps to work with some of his buddies, like the shoulder extensors, mm. right? Uh, like the lats, for example. So where right? the day before I might've been isolating a muscle and now I'm going to let them work together more to recover. Just a little active, just something a little to, to allow them to continue to move unless we've done something crazy, which I don't, I wouldn't, propose but if somebody actually did some eccentric damage then i'd just be like you know what just don't come in i'll see you in seven days right so if we're doing eccentric damage and that's the thing where people are doing this thing over and over again mm -hmm. slowly lowering the weight down to where you get so sore that you can't move that's yeah take your seven and, to ten days off and to back us up on that yep you also mentioned that going to failure is maybe not the best idea it for is, gaining lean mass that's right that's right so that just opens up a whole can of awesomeness. Yes. Um, but let's go back to where we're at now, and then we'll come back to that, hopefully, which is uh, good rest. Good rest. Yes, what good rest. What is good rest? Like, how can I do that well? Okay. So um, a lot has to do with your sleep hygiene, right? How are you preparing to rest? Mm. Are you, um, you know, do you, got your, do you have your computer in front of you, and you're like watching some stuff, or, you know, you got your TV on in the bedroom, you know, or are you there with your iPhone right before you're trying to go to sleep? Or you, do you have a bit of a routine? You go, you floss your teeth, you brush your teeth, you wash your face, um, you do some maybe some active range of motion for your body, lie down, you know, take account of your body, appreciate your body, maybe reflect on your day, run through your schedule for tomorrow, you know, think about some things you're grateful for, think about someone who you'd like to help and how you're going to do it. 
and then see if you're ready to go to sleep. Okay, I'm gonna write all that down and put that <laughs> in the description as like, here is a potential sleep hygiene yeah, routine. Yeah, that's, that's um, but even that, that, that happens to be mine. But you could do something completely different. Can you on, expand yeah. on, you said an active range of motion thing yes. before bed? Yes. Uh, why? Um, in particular, to, for you to check in. It's just a way for you to check in on how you're feeling at the end of the day. You just used your body all day. Right. So it'd be nice to kind of go, oh, yeah, that's a little that's a little achy from today. All right. I'm going to check in on that tomorrow when I wake up in the morning or maybe tomorrow night so that when you notice these things that don't go away, you see them immediately. It's not something that sneaks up on on you in five years where you finally decide you need to extend your wrist back like this. And you go, how long has it been like that? <laughs> well, five years, my friend, you just Got never it. noticed. Got it. Right? So it's like you never did the forensic accounting on your body and then boom, the IRS sends you a $600,000 bill. That's what I'm talking about, yep. right? So it's just a way you just get to check in. It's not really hard. It doesn't take a lot of time and it feels kind of nice, you know? At first it might feel overwhelming, head to toe, really? Okay, well then maybe break it up. Monday You gotta is, like it, right? You gotta like it, right? So Monday might just be wrist day. Mm -hmm. Tuesday might be shoulders in, right? You get to break it up however you need to. I like it. Yeah. And then good food. Good food. So you said good food, good rest, and good... Yes. Yeah. And I will say that this is the part that is way outside of my wheelhouse. I'm not a nutritionist. I don't even pre pretend to be one. But um, I can say eat well. Try to eat whole foods. I really enjoy cooking. Um, so that's not hard for me. I like going to the store, to the farmer's market, and getting stuff and saying, yeah, I'm going to... Have you this. always liked cooking? No. Can you tell me where you think that began for you? Um, it, began, <laughs> it began a year and... <laughs> a year, recent. Yeah, about, really a year recent. And a, about a year and a half ago, I think, something like that. Okay. Um, so um, uh, now my wife and I used to always, you know, kind of cook a little dinner together. And I would always make my own breakfast because I would get up early and have to get out to work and make my own lunch. And they were typically not very inspiring. I was like, it's... It's fuel. I remember you pulling out a raw sweet potato in class yeah, and just, just chomping on yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, we were was, all like, what's happening? <laughs> I saw food. It was just fuel, you know? And, but my wife, she loves food. She really enjoys eating. She loves food. So about a year and a half ago, um, she got a job. And we used to always cook dinner together. And, but it wasn't a big deal. It was just kind of whatever. Uh, so she got a job where she was working West Coast hours. And she's like, hon, I'm not going to be able to help with dinner. And I just saw this as an opportunity. It was really weird. I saw it as an opportunity to get closer to my wife. I was just like, if she likes food, you know what? I don't want it to be some chef who's the hero. I don't want to do that. I'll do this. So that was part of it, too. And so I, I turned out I really enjoy it. And I got this really great cookbook. And, you know. Here we are. So what's like one of your favorite dinners that you cook now? Oh, uh, uh, I like making, um, let's see this, uh, it's called a street corn, uh, where you take a corn on the cob and you, um, cook it and then you, uh, take it off the cob and then you put it in a skillet, uh, with some pretty hot oil, toast it up and then you take it out and then you add some cilantro and maybe some feta cheese. Um, so that'll be part of it. And then I'll take some, uh, I, I like to take string beans and blanch them. Um, how do you blanch string beans? I'm just, not familiar. Oh, you just put them in some really hot water for about three minutes, take them out and then spill them out on a cookie sheet. And that way they stop cooking and they're, and they're cooked. They're still nicely green. They have still a little bit of a snap, but you still have a flavor to them. Right. Uh, and then sometimes I'll just sprinkle a little bit of garlic powder on top of that. Uh, and then I'll take uh, like a pork shoulder and I'll put it in something called a sous vide bath, which is just water that's kept at a, uh, like 165, do that for what, 18 hours. Take that So out. you'll do this overnight. Yeah, I'll do that overnight. Okay. And then I'll take that out and put it on the grill and let it smoke a little bit, get a little bark on there. And then there we have it. Wow. Wow. We need <laughs> pictures of all this. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love it. It's really fun. So then you started making these dinners and she was, you yeah, know, head of her heels. She, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. She didn't even, she wouldn't even walk in the kitchen anymore. She's like, oh, yeah, no, you, you make breakfast. <laughs> yep. You do that. You know, that's your thing. I'm like, all right, baby. I love it.
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then you guys have a 14 month old. Yeah. 14 month old. Yeah. Yeah. Being like a super <laughs> geek, right? In yeah. this like movement, nervous system, yeah. electrical system. I'd almost call you like a human electrician, right? <laughs> what is that like? Um, I'm, I'm, cause mm. I've had so many fascinations with this, but what's it like seeing your daughter go from like birthing, you yeah. know, yeah. and the development? Right yeah. Um, you know, what's really interesting, Skip, is that everything that I know disappears in her presence. It vanishes. It's as if I don't even know it. And I can't explain it. And I just realized that just now. Like I, I watch her with great curiosity, but I'm not thinking, oh yeah, I can t her vestibular system is maturing now and she's starting to, you know, her, her frontal, her, she's doing the, the um, um, sagittal plane gate because she doesn't, none of that's there. It's gone. All I see is her, her mm -hmm. being curious figuring stuff out and it is amazing her learning what things she wants to struggle with and which things she decides oh, give me some help her having you know great steps forward and then pausing a little bit checking things out yeah so i i don't know i my neuroscience brain just leaves Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Amazing. But any other kid, I'm just sort of like, mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you I'm can look doing, at them I'm and stuff. I'm doing a whole breakdown. I'm, I actually, yeah. I think I empathize with that. I think I understand what you're trying to say now. What I didn't realize either is like I geek out a lot less around them than I do around people walking down the street. Yes. Like when people are walking down the street, I'm like, oh, those knees. Ooh, yeah. oh, yes. I, oh, I see all this weird stuff happening, yes, you yes. know? Yes, yes. Yes, I will say, what's interesting, now that you said that, there's, there's one thing that I did start to notice is... Um, I think she's left foot dominant, I think. But my wife is like, it's too early to see that. And I'm like, yeah, probably, you're probably right. Yeah. But when she's taking stairs, um, she always leads with her left foot. And when she even goes back upstairs, she'll lead with her left foot. Hmm. Um, but when she goes to grab things, it's either hand. You know, that's, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, oh, I have a lot of questions that yeah. we, that's like a whole nother hour. Yeah, that yeah. one idea of like left hand, right hand and development. Yes. That's like a whole nother conversation. Yes. Which actually, what's really cool about that is that, um, just the, our, our understanding of that from a neuroscience perspective has helped us understand what happens in a gym with left versus right hand dominance and how we get stronger and what kind of processes happen first. Right? Oh, we have to do another. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, I was, I was just blown. Well, let's put it this way. One of the things that I love to do is I love looking at this neuroscience literature and going, I know they're just talking about a dorsal interosseous muscle in someone who's right-hand dominant but they have no idea how this applies to the bigger world. Mm. And that's the thing that just turns me on like nobody's business is understanding how these scientists who are just in there looking at very small things under very specific conditions are giving us really valuable information about how this stuff works and how we can better design exercises for each other. So to put a bow on that yes. and a lot of this conversation, if people were to go out and take this information and, and obviously go farther with it too, mm -hmm. and they were to do this exercise thing mm -hmm. with enough recovery mm -hmm. at the appropriate intensities for their goals yes. to enjoy the process of yes. doing that exercise, right? Yes. To feed themselves well with mostly whole foods. Yes. To, uh, the second thing was get that sleep routine really yes. dialed in, get your recovery dialed in. Yes. What's the result for someone if they went from not doing any of that consciously mm. to now consciously doing bit by bit and making themselves uh, more, more routine based in these things and, and healthier yes. in these ways? What would that result in for their brain um, or just their life experience? That's a great question. Um, I think of it like hmm, if you were to pick a point in your life where you felt like you had boundless energy, even if it was for one hour, you had boundless en energy, tremendous focus and grace for everybody around you. 
Meaning you wouldn't be short with someone who cuts you off. You wouldn't be short with someone who, who doesn't have the same opinion. You're just, you're just, you're just open. You're okay. You're strong. You can hold the space. That's what I think this does for us. I, I really, there, there is, some, and sometimes people have never experienced it before until they have this experience of exercising in a way that truly frees them. It allows them to be in touch with their physical selves, to honor everything that's going on in their head and to interact with someone who actually cares about that experience and goes, okay, but empowers you to manage your own experience. That's freedom. And I think it really, it, it opens us up, opens us up to grace that, that, that feeling that, um, I, I can be forgiving of other people's shortcomings or, or, or the fact that they didn't think about how what they did or said affects me. It's okay. We're human. It's okay. It's all right. I'm strong. I'm not threatened. I'm all right. So what you're saying is <laughs> potentially there is a, a life experience, a way to live in yes. this body for everyone. Yes. That if they did these simple things well, it will change your life. It'll change the quality of your life as much as, and, and, and I think skip what I'd love help with. I'd love help from you, from anybody out there who's, who can help me with this is just as you have people who have been masterful at delivering content that helps people um, change their negative beliefs. I think of the, the, the Tony Robbins of the world, you know, exercise has that same potential. And I don't mean instead of, but I mean with those things, with whatever mechanism that you're using to improve the quality of your life, man, I'm telling you, if you can get your physical self behind it, I agree. And that's why we're here right now. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to learn more about this, I'm sure they're all going to be fascinated by mm. you and by all these ideas. Mm. Where do they start? Do, are there books? Are there mm. uh, people they can follow? Should they follow you? Uh, where can they read about it? Where can they learn about this stuff and, and dive that's deeper? A, that's a really good question. Um, because what we've discussed here is uh, so interdisciplinary. Um, uh, there's, it's hard to say that there's one place to start, but I will say if there's a couple of books. I'll say uh, read um, um, The Brain That Changes Itself. I would say uh, there's another book called um, um, How Do You Feel? Um, and it's about interoception, which is a very important um, system in our body that literally gives you it, it, it is that when someone asks you how you're doing and you take a moment and you kind of check in and you realize you got a little ache over here a little pain something that actually downright hurts right there and something just feels tight over here and you actually go no oh, i'm not feeling so great that's interoception when you walk into the gym and you really don't feel like doing much you just get this feeling you just like you look at that exercise that you usually like and you're like I don't even want to do that today. That's interoception. So that book is um, How Do You Feel um, is uh, a great start in trying to understand what that is and how profound it is. Um, the Mind That Changes Itself, that's a great book too. So is The Mind and the Brain. Um, and absolutely, I definitely you know follow me. Uh, I like to put up little videos every now and then about these subjects and um, how we can implement it into our exercises. What else is out there? Well, that's good for now. I think yeah. also, uh, this is, we're overhauling it currently. Everything. Mm. I, I didn't even realize how parallel we were with everything that happened in the, in the dojo. Mm. And it's like, all of this is in there. And you mm. know, what's even crazier about that yeah, yeah. is I didn't know about that book. How do you feel? But I yeah. have a meditation in there called, how do you feel yeah. <laughs> that teaches you how to feel that that's right. The exact same that's concept. Right. So you must've taught it. And then I forgot that you taught that. You know, what's so, you know, what's so interesting though, Skip is that some of the hardest people to teach that are athletes because they are, because they are told so often to forget about how you feel, mm. perform, perform, right? Which, yeah, there might be a time and a place for that. But there's also a time and place for, no, 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 what's going on in here? So this is a big deal mm -hmm. where a lot of people who were athletes in their past yes. take on a lot of these mindsets of training mm -hmm. into yes. their adulthood, non-athletic lives, which 
creates this whole thing of like the people that look the most fit tend to be those previous athletes. And then now we're stuck in the most influential people, you know, your neighbor, Bob, who looks like a football player still is teaching you how to exercise yes, in this way. Yes, so yes. there, there needs to be more leadership in general yes. in this like fitness community. And yes. obviously I think following you is like the yes. gold nugget of all of this, which is why he's on the show right now. <laughs> and where, how do people follow you? Instagram, Facebook, like yes. where, where do they go? Um, if you go to Instagram and find me on the exercise design lab, Okay. the exercise design lab. Um, that's the best place to find me. I post on Facebook, the same, uh, the exercise design lab, not quite as frequently, but I'm up there too. So Instagram's a way yeah. to find you and to stalk you to yes. learn stuff. <laughs> yes. That's a way to do it. That's awesome. a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Yes. Did you ever go back and explore what's in between one and two? Uh, yes, 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 I did. Yes, I did. Is it simple or is it complex? Um, it's very complex. Um, but there are things called complex numbers, right? And, um, and there, are, and as a matter of fact, there are different numbering systems to explore what's between one and two um, and what happens between zero and one. Um, and even, even um, as a, as... Uh, members of our society, how we count. There are some people that don't differentiate be beyond five. It's one, two, three, four, five, and then there's more. <laughs> <laughs> and every kid has to, at some point, buy into this thing because kids don't get that either. They go one, two, three, and more. And when they first learn how to say numbers, they're just parroting. And at some point they buy into our shenanigans of the counting, blah, blah, blah. So. Okay. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. We will dig into that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, it's for my pleasure, Skip. Thank doing you. This. And I hope we get 17 more because I have that. I got yeah. two questions out of like 20. Oh, really? Yeah, We're going to keep great. doing this. Yeah. I, I yeah, mean, yeah. It. it's my pleasure and thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, it means a lot to me. Well, social distancing fist bump. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, yeah. I'll turn it all off. All right.